It's easy to idealize life on a university campus. It's data that we collect for ourselves. Intellectual discussions. Debating ideas. Hearing new perspectives. But it's an ideal that seems out of reach for some people. Students say they're being censored, not even allowed to bring up controversial points of view, like here at Ryerson University. I kind of came to the university thinking that it was a place where people could freely exchange ideas, push boundaries, but it was really just this padded room where everybody's trying to control a message under the guise of making everyone safe which is BS, honestly. Kevin Ariola started the Men's Issues Awareness Society. It hasn't helped with his popularity on campus. Sorry. The group is confined to meeting in this tiny room. It's more like a closet. They're stuck here because the students' union refused to give the group official status, calling it anti-feminist. So provide a fathering after separation program. Ironically, women make up most of the group. Hopefully we can dismantle some of the ideas that people have about the group. Ariola just wanted a space for students to talk about problems affecting men. I've seen a lot of abuse happen to men in my own family. Like I, I know a few young men that have committed suicide. We tackled, you know, men's mental health. After the student union raised the alarm, he became a target. It was this event held by the Feminist Collective, and I was passing by. I think I stood around for maybe like 10 minutes. And then I see in the paper the next day that the Feminist Collective had said that my presence there had made the space unsafe, that, that I was dangerous. I wasn't used to being called a violent misogynist. All the publicity on campus turned him into the face of a movement despised by some students. It was a lot of pressure. I, I wasn't used to it. It all just kind of snowballed into me becoming a giant mess. I started drinking quite a bit um, and not talking to anybody about it. So that was my own man's issue. Ariola is now taking on the student union. We don't want to. We don't want to make people feel that. Oh, I've had a bad experience. Here. Men's groups are part of the new frontier in the fight over point. censorship. Um, that was something I was fearful of. What happens on campuses can define generations. Debates have raged for decades over what people are allowed to say or do at a university. At the root, it's usually a question over the role of a student union or university in protecting people and some conflicts keep coming back. Abortion is one example. Life starts when the child's Not just the controversy over whether they should be legal, but what people can express. People clashed at UBC almost 20 years ago. This is an issue of not freedom of speech, but of hatred, and I believe this is hate literature. And now, at the University of Alberta, a new fight has flared up on that same issue. Education student Amberly Nickel heads the campus pro life group. Two years ago, her group set up a graphic display in the middle of campus. Loud protesters moved right in front of them. Our signs are pretty tall, but uh, their bed sheets and signs were even taller, and so okay. it made it very difficult to see what was going on. And you guys were just in this area here. Mm -hmm. Nickel says those protesters broke the student code of conduct by blocking their display. Your images are lies! Well, security did nothing. Neither, she says, did the university administration. That's who she's now fighting. The next time she tried to hold an event, it told her she'd have to pay more than $17,000 for security. I feel like that amounted to censorship. If you put a price tag on free speech by saying, um, the more controversial you are, the more you have to pay for security fees, right? Um, that immediately shuts down 
discourse for people who are either too unpopular or too poor to have their voices heard on campus. The university administration wouldn't talk about this case, but it says security fees are something all groups have to pay if they hold an event where things could blow up. And they sure did in Berkeley, California this past February. A student protest turned into a riot after campus conservatives invited Milo Yiannopoulos to speak. He's a far-right commentator, critical of feminism and Islam. No, it's not free speech, it's hate speech. Some call it mob censorship. Others would probably say it's activists trying to affect change. There are multiple cases here in Canada as well. We got those fascists out of here. Like when the rebel media founder Ezra Levant speaks at a university. He has views on Islam that some say cross the line. Here he is at Ryerson in March. If you look in cities like Rotterdam, the second city of Holland, the Muslim population is... This is at the University of Toronto a month earlier. You go to Black Lives Matter, which is mostly white in Toronto. You go to... I went to an I Don't Know More protest. It was about 100 people, and there were only about three Aboriginal... Well, there's a shock. There's a complete shock. Someone called the fire alarm. Outside in the hallway, anger. How dare you bring my parents in Cassandra Williams, in the black hoodie, was protesting that day. She's also part of the students' union. She says free speech is sometimes used as an excuse, allowing people to express views that are racist or transphobic. It's just a lie, really, to claim that some of these things are, like, free and, like, genuine debates. Every time some, like, hateful person decides to get up and say, you know what, trans people don't deserve rights, or um, members of this racialized community are less human, Every single time someone says that, we do not need to immediately turn to them and consider their opinion. Yeah. We'll help to reclaim space on campus. As a transgender yeah. woman, she's felt hurt Make and singled out. And it's over a bitter dispute on campus. <laughs> Spurred on by the views of psychology professor Jordan Peterson. He's a cult hero to free speech advocates, but his detractors are just as passionate. Hey, they drowned out his talk at McMaster University in March. Peterson frequently speaks out against a proposed federal bill, C-16. It would amend human rights law, so you can't discriminate against people based on their gender identity or expression. But Peterson sees it as a threat to free speech, because it would force him to address people by their preferred gender pronouns. The first time I've seen in our legislative history where people are attempting to make us speak their language. Check out this rally for free speech on the U of T campus. Peterson was the main attraction. This event propelled him into the spotlight. The radical left activists are trying to turn this into an argument about sexual politics. And it's only nominally about sexual politics. It's about language that's designed to control our freedom of expression. Peterson's opponents showed up. They tampered with the speakers, trying to prevent him from being heard. One of Peterson's supporters had enough. We need some men here, people. Men need to stop this nonsense. He's brilliant. Badly! Sometimes they go much further than Peterson does like during the rally's open mic session, this rant about transgender people. Do you think people love them? Do you think they're hugged and taken care of? Do you think people love those people? Do you think they're listened to? No! But tattooing your body and cutting off your genitals. If a person is coming at this topic from the perspective that trans people are deviant, they're irrational, they're mentally ill, they're not deserving of the same rights and consideration as everyone else, then there's no debate to even be had. It's the idea that certain things are so offensive and so triggering 
that we can't talk about it. After organizing that rally for Professor Peterson, Jeff Liu started a club at the U of T. Thank you very much for coming out. Called Students in Support of Free Speech. This is an extremely contentious topic. He resists the idea that speech should be limited to protect people. I have a lot of sympathy and empathy for those who are marginalized. <laughs> However, does it mean that we baby them? Does it mean that they cannot withstand any criticism? Or does it mean we cannot discuss issues that surround those marginalized or vulnerable community, even if it is uh, not to their benefit in the short term or even if it offends them. His version of free speech is especially broad. It would even make room for something that could be considered a crime, inciting genocide. He's seen it online against transgender people. I think those are reprehensible things and I would argue with that person and I'd say that person's ignorant, perhaps even vile. but. Um, as far as condemn, condemning them and using the power of the law against them, I don't think it's reasonable to do that either. Is it the university that was... Shaheen Imtiaz is the student union's vice president of campus life. For her, limiting what people can say is about keeping others safe. Sexist comments and transphobic comments. She says some groups, like pro-life and men's clubs, just shouldn't form at universities. The student union is a nonprofit organization. We do have the right to um, not um, recognize groups on campus that we think are not um, working to the benefit of, of like the larger campus. And we exist so that students who are not being taken care of, students who are being marginalized, can have a space and can have a voice. Universities should provide a safe space from assault, from physical harm, uh, but not a safe space from feeling upset about ideas you disagree with. I mean, the university should have one big... Lawyer John Carpe feels so passionately about free speech, he started a law firm in Calgary focused on it. No gleaming office tower for him. He runs the Justice Centre for Constitutional Freedoms out of this basic two-bedroom apartment. His line on free speech is the criminal code. If you're calling for any person or group of people to be murdered or to have their houses burned down or to be robbed or assaulted, that's already illegal criminal speech. So there's already a healthy boundary there. Carpe is now representing both the anti-abortion group in Edmonton and the men's issues group at Ryerson. Both have issued court challenges, claiming their speech was muzzled. Carpe's organization puts together what it calls a campus freedom index. It tracks incidents of censorship on campuses all across the country. What's in bad shape, it looks to be getting worse. It seems to be, it might get worse before it gets better. Free speech isn't just um, being able to voice an, an idea, it's about being able to choose how that idea is voiced, right? Amberly Nickel graduates this year, so she won't even be part of the anti-abortion group once the legal case is decided. For her, this is about creating change for the next generation of students, so they don't have to face the same challenges. Everything worth discussing in this life tends to be controversial, and if we can't discuss those controversial issues, then how are we ever supposed to move forward as a society? Back at Ryerson, there's a new president of the Men's Issues Awareness Society now. Kevin Ariola is still involved, but needed some space. It's now a woman in charge of tackling men's issues. She plans to apply again for official group status. I just, I got really frustrated when I heard about with what happened to Kevin. So it just became more of an issue with me that, you know, our own school isn't allowing a group to talk about, to just have a discussion. I've taken a step back. Not having his group recognized by the Students' uh, Union really has had a big impact on Ariola. This really opened my eyes and made me realize that um, you know, all speech should be protected. You know, today it's me that can't talk about men's issues and men's mental health. Um, you know, tomorrow it might be another group. I, I wouldn't say we can't have a space where both groups uh, mm -hmm. yeah. get together. And at a recent so, meeting, so two people showed up to express their concerns about the group. I was just worried that it would be um, an anti-feminist space. In the end, they all talked uh, and listened. I think from my perspective, uh, you've already somewhat ameliorated my fears about what this was going to be. It's just one group uh, on one night, but they did manage to find some common ground. I, I, I honestly don't really have words. There's a couple of times that I, I almost teared up in the, this meeting and all the ideas that have come out. Uh, it's really, it's really nice. Confronting those you disagree with, 
debating. It doesn't always result in a consensus. But when you're willing to hear opposing views, difficult ideas, maybe that academic ideal can be reached. Lorenda Redekop, CBC News, Toronto. Uh, domestic abuse uh, 